All right, so this is the opening new default view of SolidWorks. Uh, if you are used to vector programs like Maya, Blender, this might seem a little unfamiliar to you, but a lot of the same functionality is here. The difference between a vector program versus a parametric modeling software and uh, with vectors, you are concerned about vectors. So it's more about shape and form where SolidWorks and other parametric modeling suites are going to be more dimension based. Uh, so you're going to be thinking more about the structure of an object and how it is constructed versus just the overall flow of the shape. Now, when you're talking about uh, physical objects at the at a higher level things like cars automobiles planes you start to see a little bit of a blending of the two because obviously a car has a very organic uh, set of contours applied to it and you are going to find that most vehicles are designed using parametric modeling software like we see here and so that's where it the definitions between them start to get blurred a little bit um, you can achieve very similar results in both kinds of software, that is parametric versus vector, but your approach is going to be inherently different. And one of the first things you'll want to do when you are starting a document is make sure that you are using the correct unit system. Um, because Star Citizen is a science fiction based game, its units are science based. <laughs> Uh, and that is to say it's not going to be inch pounds and seconds. Now I am from the United States. I currently live in Utah, but I cannot put to words how much I hate the imperial system. I much prefer metric things are just so much easier in base 10. Um, for our purposes, we're going to leave it in this CGS centimeter, gram, and second. The reason why we're going to do that is we're going to go for a 1 100th scale model of our constellation. So knowing that the constellation is about 61 meters in length, we can use that to give ourselves some easy conversions in trying to make a 1 100th scale model here. First thing we need to do is we need to import our image that we worked on previously. So we go to sketch tools, Oh, actually, correction, we do need to start a sketch first. And this is the basic workflow for SOLIDWORKS. I'm not going to claim to be an expert. I am still learning every day. But instead of pushing and pulling vertices and faces like you would in a vector modeling software, in SOLIDWORKS you draw a sketch and then you derive the forms from that sketch. And so our first sketch in this case is going to be adding our image that we want to use. So we do that under sketch tools and then we do sketch picture. And then from my perspective, since I have used this folder before in SOLIDWORKS, like I did mention, I did give a first attempt off camera, um, but it brings us to your file explorer. Um, I'm going to load this image and do you want to keep things high resolution? This is going to take a minute. All right, here we are. So we've added we, we, we've added our uh, our sketch here. So this is where we start to see our first hint at the dimensionality that I've mentioned come into play. Uh, we're going to drag this dot to the front of our ship. And then we're going to drag this tail section to the end. And when we do that, it's going to ask us how long this line is. Now, like I said, the constellation in the game is about 61 meters. If we want to keep a similar scale, we're going to call this 61. And that's going to default to whatever your base unit for the uh, file is, which in our case is centimeters. The other thing that we can do is we can go ahead and move this down to our origin point 
and that'll help us just kind of keep things in line. Now, you're not going to base things strictly off of your sketch. You use this as a guideline. Um, you're going to depend on the software itself to give more precise measurements of everything else. But this is what we're going to have as our sketch one. So we're going to keep this visible and then we're going to start adding some lines on top of this. I'm going to kind of speed through that. And I don't want to make you watch me place every line meticulously as is going to be required. But I'm going to take some pauses every now and then to kind of get you caught up to speed as to where we are in the process. The astute observer among you will probably notice that I'm not actually placing many lines here at all, but rather I'm going through and defining some basic variables. I'm going to go over what that process is in the next speaking section here. But SolidWorks is very cool in that you can use variables as a way to speed up your workflow by a huge margin. So as I'm going through defining 95 degrees, that's what we're doing. All right, I know right now it doesn't look like we've achieved a lot, but with SolidWorks, I find that a lot of the work that you do in the foundation of your folder, of your file, saves you work in the long run. So what I've been working on here is figuring out some basic dimensions that I probably want to keep using throughout the rest of the file. And we set those up as equations. So for instance, here, I said, I want to have a 15 degree angle between these two parts. Well, that means that down here at these more sharp corners, we're going to have a pretty consistent angle if we keep that pattern going throughout the rest of the ship. Now we can see that that equates to 97.5. The way that we've defined that though, is we use something called an equation. So if I pull up my equation sheet, we see our door angle equals 97.5 degrees. That is 90 plus 15 divided by 2, 97.5. And another thing we see here is we have our door width radius. And there's probably a better term for it than radius because radius is for circles, but this is the naming convention I'm going to stick with. And that is equal to door width divided by 2. Okay, well, what's door width? Well, door width is the next line, and it's 1.5 centimeters, which if we scale that up to the real world would be one and a half meters, which is a pretty good size for a door, um, especially you know, one that's going to be a main passageway. 1.5 meters in width should be plenty for the relatively compact uh, ship interior that we're expecting to have. Door width divided by two or a door width radius is important because we can copy a lot of these lines over this construction line when we're ready to do so. So instead of having to draw the whole ship, I can draw basically half the ship and then extrapolate more information when I need to. But doing these things at the outset of creating your file, that's gonna save me work down the road because when it comes to designing this door down here, I'll just copy the same information and keep it going on down the line. I don't need to define this wall angle here as 97.5 each and every time. Now another thing I want to point out while we're looking at this is we are very quickly departing from our base sketch. As we start to scale things to a more realistic human size scale, we're going to see that that wasted space in the constellation definitely rears its head here as it's going to make things seem rather small within the volumes that we're working with. Now that's something that we're trying to overcome is we want to make better use of the constellation. But as once I get to adding these chairs, for instance, you're going to see that these chairs look significantly smaller when we give them a more realistic human size scale. And that's going to contribute to being able to pack a lot more functionality into the cockpit area. So I just want you to keep that in mind as I add some of these further details. In fact, let's talk about that. While we're watching this design process, tell me things that you would like to see added to the functionality of the constellation, given that once we compress everything, we do have quite a bit more space. It's, uh, it's kind of like the old meme, there's so much space for activities. And that's kind of what we end up here. 
with. Uh, the seats, a lot smaller than they appear in this view. Uh, they're going to be quite a bit smaller, as we're going to see. And the rooms, likewise, the all the furniture and stuff I drew here was huge compared to how they actually need to be sized up. The other thing I want to encourage you to do is uh, ask me questions about the parametric design process down in the comments. I can't promise that I'll immediately know the answer, but I think that this will be a good learning experience for both of us. If you ask me a question that I don't know the answer to, that will probably get me started on a lesson for myself, right? But I know that there is a lot of resources out there for people wanting to learn vector modeling, but there's not as much for people that are trying to do parametric modeling. Um, certainly nothing that is uh, related to designing a spaceship. I kind of feel like I'm going out on a limb myself here, so uh, let's talk about it. What would you like to see uh, done in parametric modeling? What kind of questions do you have? Um, and if you are a seasoned parametric modeler, your input is also equally valuable to me as well. If you can come up with a better way to do the things that I'm doing, I would love to see it because I want to get better at using the software. I feel like I have a good grasp on it, but it can always be improved. And so if there are any professionals in my audience, I would love your input and let me know how I can do things faster, do things better, be a little bit more efficient. But uh, talking about the process here, obviously we're adding a lot more lines and we're referencing those same uh, equations that we looked at before. So every time you see one of those red epsilon symbols, we are referencing one of the equations and therefore one of the variables that we put into our uh, data sheet. So every time we do that, that's one more time I don't have to rewrite that value again. All right, so here is a cool thing to show off one of the one of the really great features about a parametric modeling software is you can go back and change your dimensions and it will update the model. Uh, so I know I'm still here on the layout step. Um, we are going to get to having a three-dimensional thing in the near future, but uh, I was previously operating on the assumption that a, uh, that a standard cargo unit was a one meter cubed box. That is apparently not the case. Um, so it's actually, it's actually 1.25 meters cubed, or 1.25 meters in all directions for a total of 1.95 meters cubed, it looks like. So let's actually fix this dimension because this should be an equation. Cargo grid length, here we go. And so that gives us a very, very small cargo grid. Now it is still going to be smaller than the original drawing that we're working off of here, but it is going to get a little bit bigger. So if we come into our, into our equations, Let's add an SCU variable. And this is going to be equal to 1.25 units. And then we can multiply that onto our cargo units here. I gotta put in quotes. So eight times SCU, standard cargo unit, gives us 10. And we can see that that's updated in real time. And so let's go ahead and do the same thing to these ones down here. And just to keep track of our order of operations, I'm gonna add some parentheses just to make sure I'm not messing up my arithmetic. And height is not shown currently, 
but it will be in the future when we start adding that third dimension to this. And so and that's updated all of our dimensions in real time, which means that this is now a more accurate representation of what our cargo grid size should be. I'm giving us a 1.5 meter walkway. That's gonna keep our ship wheelchair accessible. Uh, let's actually look up what that dimension is. I'm not super familiar with working with ADA limitations or criteria. Wheelchair accessible width. I think it's three feet. Okay, 32 inches. The minimum clear width for a single wheelchair passage is 32 inches at a point and 36 inches continuously. So if my understanding for that is hmm. Okay, so yeah, 32 inches is the minimum. So wheelchairs, you definitely want to give them a little bit of a buffer. You don't want to pinch any fingers. So 36 feet or <laughs> inches, holy cow, 36 feet, can you imagine? That would be some big hallways. Um, but uh, 36 inches to meters, I know is less than one meter. Yeah, so <laughs> with our dimensions, we're actually wheelchair accessible. So if you did want to bring your wheelchair onto a constellation, which I don't know why you would, that does sound miserable, uh, you could though. So, you know, we're very forward thinking with this chip design. But I just wanted to show off how, how easy it is to update uh, your equations and how that can carry into future uh, changes that you may need to make to a model. I've had it be before where I've gone through the design process and then decided that I wanted to use a different screw size. So as long as I define that screw size somewhere, I can just go and change the <laughs> Holy cow, did you hear my voice crack? I can just go and change the size in the equation sheet and then it will update all of the screw size holes across the entire model. That's one of the really great powerful features about using a parametric modeling software like SolidWorks. And you'll find very similar functionality in things like Fusion 360, AutoCAD. All the parametric modeling softwares that are used professionally will have very comparable feature sets. And much of this process is a lot of wash, rinse, repeat. Uh, what you don't see in the background is I am pretty much constantly looking up dimensions of common household items. So for the beds, for instance, I know I want those to be a little longer than the average human would be when they're lying down. So average human, 1.7 meters, bed, two meters wide, two meters long. Um, that's based off of some uh, I believe it's a twin size bed is what I use for reference, which seems like a pretty good starting point for a ship barrack. Um, you see a little bit of a struggle here in trying to get the references to copy over correctly once everything is mirrored to the other side. I do fix that in a future iteration, but sometimes SolidWorks will forget some of the relations you establish, and so you'll need to kind of redefine things quickly in order to get things working well again. And here we're taking a, a little stab at getting our first bit of three-dimensional geometry. I'm not going to end up keeping this. So we find ourselves at another kind of inflection point. Um, here we have the front right kind of winglet cantered wing shape from our original design. And don't worry, the other stuff is still here. In fact, I can, I can make Sketch one visible. That's not the one I wanted though. I wanted sketch two. So all the stuff that we've drawn is still here. And uh, we can still reference it later on. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, the size of the seats is going to seem really quite small compared to what we're used to in game. Um, all of these are based off of a 0.75 seat width, which is roughly consistent with the dimensions I found online for things like a driver's seat width. I've applied the same dimension here to the bench, 
and that has caused our bathroom to get a bit bigger but hey instead of a toilet now we can have a dedicated shower toilet sink it can be a much nicer accommodation overall we've got some block outs for the seats over here and we've got our kind of continuous throughway the 1.5 meter corridor that runs the length of the ship over here we've got a two meter long bed it's one meter wide and that should be about the size of a twin bed from what I've been able to find. So it should be comfortable for a single person sleeping on it. And when we ex extrude our first shape that we have here, uh, we start to see how the parametric process is a bit different than the vector based process. Uh, first off, you can roll back. So if we go to just the extrude, we have a straight extrude of some of the polygons that we've drawn. And this maintains the dimensions that we defined in our sketch. And then we add what's called a chamfer. And a chamfer is a angled cut along the edge. So this has a 15 degree chamfer, which means that the angle between this top surface and this curved surface is 15 degrees. And it can do this in three dimensions, which is pretty cool, which makes getting the angled cuts that are present on the Connie design is actually quite easy to do. Now, where this starts to get a little bit challenging is adding in the interior rooms. I'll admit I'm a bit outside my depth. I've never attempted anything like this in the past, so I might make quite a few mistakes, but I think we'll get there in the end. Uh, this is an extrusion of four centimeters from our base plane, our top plane. Uh, I think I need to make it actually a little bit taller because we need to give uh, ourselves two floors here. And if we know that our character height is 1.8 meters tall, a good ceiling height is probably in the realm of 2.25 meters or in our case 2.25 centimeters, the angled arrowhead shape is meant to encapsulate both floors. So that would give us four and a half meters at least that it needs to be tall. And we need to add a little bit more to that to give the ship a sense of functionality and form. So probably five centimeters is what I want to uh, extrude that out to. And that is fortunately very easy to do. We just come into our design feature and we update that extrude unit to five and there you go. Now we've extruded five centimeters. Now one limitation that SolidWorks does have is sometimes the chamfer tool does not work quite the way you think it should. Let's see, 90 minus 15 would give me 75. Sometimes it can be a little goofy. I'm gonna call an audible on this part. Uh, this is a classic case of the computer does exactly what you tell it to. But if you don't know what you're telling it to do, then it doesn't seem like it's working. Uh, SolidWorks works exactly as it's intended to most of the time. It's not perfect, nothing is, but in this case the issue is really caused by my limited knowledge of how the feature works. I do realize that all I'm missing is a simple checkbox um, in order to get this chamfer working correctly, and that's one of those things that just comes with experience, right? But if you've used any uh, creative software, you know how sometimes it seems like there is something going on in the machine. I find that usually that ends up being that I'm not understanding something myself. So one lesson that I'm trying to take away is when I have those moments, take the time to stop and consider what am I possibly getting wrong? What could I do differently and how can I turn this into a learning experience? I'm not perfect at always applying that philosophy, but if you keep a growth mindset like that, you're going to advance so much faster, and it applies with so many things, not just learning how to model in SolidWorks. 
All right, I lied a little bit. I think we're gonna do <laughs> a bit more work on uh, on this. Uh, one thing that I'm realizing is I need to I need to go through and make a side profile sketch. I was going to try and skip it, but in order for me to get the best results, I need to keep myself disciplined, and we need to do a side profile sketch. And this refers to something called isometric views. And if you're looking at a, at, at a set of blueprints, sorry, not isometric, orthographic, that's what I meant. Uh, this is what you would see in a lot of uh, blueprints. You have your isometric view, which is basically all axes are kind of a neutral perspective. There's not any, uh, there's not any diminishing as you go further into the canvas. And then you have your orthographic projections, which are like you see here, top, front, and then a side. And what this in theory gives you is all the information that you would need to reconstruct a 3D object. So we can see a similar idea here with the stairs, right? From the side or from the front, you see the height that each step needs to be. From the side, you see how that corresponds to the top view. So using a combination of these views, you should be able to get your three-dimensional object. Uh, right now, we got part of a top view. So we need to go through and add a side view. So I'm gonna go through the same process I went before in setting up a sketch picture that will be representative of the side view, and then we'll work on transferring some of our dimensions onto that view. But before I do that, real quick, I do want to show you one of the really cool things about parametric modeling in SolidWorks. And again, this applies to most parametric modeling software, uh, is the ability to roll something back. So, hold on, sorry. So we, we you can go all the way back and suppress everything and then you can roll it forward again if you so choose. So we can unsuppress this. We can unsuppress these ones and then it just kind of rebuilds the object again. All right, so that's one of the really cool things about 3D modeling in a parametric software suite is that you can go back and change things and then if I keep my rollback line at this point and I make changes, I'm starting back from this save point. So I don't need to rebuild it every time. I can try different things, save it as a new document, come back to this one. Maybe I don't like the changes I made. So there's a lot of versatility built in with that. And I'm not even doing the best at showing how much functionality that gives you, but it's really very impressive. If you've done any 3D modeling, you you know that if you make a mistake, it can sometimes be a bear to undo that. Another thing I want to touch on, <laughs> I know I keep derailing, but uh, you know that you're done with the sketch when you've got all black lines. This is kind of a sloppy sketch, if I'm honest. This isn't my cleanest work. But if I do a control Z here, you can see that this line on this construction line is blue. That means that it's not fixed. So once we give that a dimension, it's 9 and 4, now it's 10, now it's black. So black is good in SolidWorks. It means that you are done with your sketch, or at least everything is defined. So usually when you get to this point, you're kind of just tracking down the last blue points and trying to get rid of them. Uh, the reason why you want to do that is because when you pass this off to someone else, their computer is probably going to need to rebuild this, and having everything clearly defined means that you get a consistent product. If you have something that's blue in your sketch, when it does the rebuild on someone else's computer, it might not build the same way. And so you want everything to be well defined. It also makes it easier to reference in future sketches, which is what we are finally moving on to now.
Generally speaking, in parametric modeling software, you want to have as few sketches as possible. And the more sketches you make, the more points of failure you have when it comes to trying to track down where was that reference that I was using. It can get pretty convoluted pretty quick. And just like if you've ever done a drawing in Photoshop, you can get to 100 layers pretty quick. You can also get to 100 sketches in SolidWorks pretty quick. So keeping your workspace organized, trying to minimize the number of sketches that you have, that's all going to help you be a little more efficient. As I'm doing the work on the side sketch, you're going to notice that I'm flipping to that top sketch all the time. That's because there's a lot of reference points that I need to have consistent between the two. And when we're turning this into a three-dimensional object, those points have to correspond with each other. So if I set up that healthy foundation now, that will save me a lot of work in the future. And I'm kind of pushing SolidWorks outside of what it is kind of really meant to do. And this is definitely something that would be probably a little better in something like Blender or Maya because I'm doing a bit too much of the exploration here, I feel like. Um, I'm trying to define things on the fly, trying to get them to work together. And you would typically want to have done a bit more work into figuring out what size everything needs to be first before you come into SolidWorks to make your model. But here we're working on getting a rough reference for the P52 Merlin. That is, of course, the snub fighter currently equipped on the Constellation series. Assuming that that does not change with the Mark II, we need to make sure that it fits in the clamshell that we'll be adding down below. So you'll see I'm making some adjustments to the top sketch so that we can extrapolate some more room for the bottom floor. Basically, we need to move a few of the walls forward so that if we keep our bottom and top floor consistent, there will be adequate space for the snub fighter down below. This is one of the concerns that many people expressed when we did the two-dimensional drawing, and you know what? It's valid. <laughs> it's something that I didn't quite account for as well as I could have, but uh, we get there in the end. Eventually we do get it so that we have a more consistent top and bottom floor, and that's why having this side sketch became so important. If I had tried to do everything based off of just the top sketch, first off, I would lose a lot of detail on the sides. I would have to figure out more convoluted ways to get that detail back, but it also would require a lot more rewriting as time went on in order to get things to work well together. And try to think about, uh, well, actually Star Citizen is a good example. There's a lot of ships that are being made now that have a lot more of a rich feature set compared to the ships that were made before. Well, the ships that were made before had no idea what the feature set was going to be, and so they had no chance to be fully representative of the gameplay that we have today. But newer ships with more of that um, pre-production planning going on, they benefit from having more knowledge about what the game is. Same thing kind of applies here. The more planning you can do beforehand, the more effective and the more efficient you can be later on. Here I'm just trying a couple tricks to get this equally spaced in that room, and here we go. That's a pretty good looking side sketch, if I do say so myself. All right, we've got a, uh, got a pretty good start on our side sketch going so far. Uh, first thing I did was kind of lay out the basic block shapes um, I defined the roof height as 2.25 meters, which in our case is going to be 2.25 centimeters because we're reducing everything by 100. And I looked up some basic specs for the P52 Merlin. It is 3 meters tall, 5 and a quarter meter wide, and 12 meters in length. Replicating that into our sketch gives us a box that is 12 centimeters by 3 centimeters tall and we've accommodated it quite nicely here uh, in the bottom half of the ship. I've got the cockpit placed halfway between the upper and lower floor, and what I want to do is work in some way to get a stairway that unifies all three sections. Uh, back here we've got our 
cut out for the cargo bay. The cargo bay, in order to accommodate all the boxes, and needs to be 3.75. Yeah, 3.75. And then I want to have it below the gangway. So that pushes it down a little bit, so that the cargo come, rises up to the walkway, but not past it. The reason why we're doing that is that will make it so that if we want to make a Phoenix version of this ship, we can extend the luxury area all throughout the top floor without having to do too much uh, elevation changes. And I think that that'll help it feel a little bit more continuous. And then we've got a long sloping uh, back, kind of like a fast back on an old vintage car. And similarly, we've got a sloped back here on the bottom. Uh, I'm going to play around with this a little bit off screen. Uh, this is one of the more challenging parts that we're getting to is I'm going to start to need to create some compound curves. And I don't want to make you watch me try to figure that out. But uh, we'll touch back after I've done some work. So I hope you've enjoyed this part two, uh, I guess we'll call it. Um, that we're starting to get into some 3D modeling software. I am a mechanical engineering student, so when I think 3D modeling, I think parametric software. I've tinkered a bit with Blender in the past, but I, I feel more comfortable with SolidWorks, and so in spite of the challenges that SolidWorks brings to a project like this, I think this is going to be the way that I want to show it. And I'm, I'm hoping that you enjoy this perspective, because it's a great opportunity to learn some of the basics of parametric software which you're probably not going to use as much in the video game industry, but if you go into STEM, you are going to see parametric software all the time. It is a very powerful suite of tools. It has a lot of unique functionality to differentiate it from vector modeling. And that's not to say that vector modeling is bad, okay? I don't wanna give that idea. They are fundamentally different. They have different end goals, different workflows, and it's just something that I feel like younger people aren't exposed to as much as something like Blender. You know, typically when someone looks into getting into 3D modeling, they'll find something like Blender first because they're probably interested in video games. Well, I'm hoping to captivate, or I'm, I'm hoping to hone in on that exact thing here. Parametric software, Maybe not the best for designing video game assets, but I hope that by showing you what it looks like, maybe this will give you that interest into jumping into STEM. It's a very rewarding field. I really enjoy it. And the problem solving that is involved in, in it is very fun to me. Um, I don't think in quite the right way to be very successful with Blender, but uh, parametric software, it feels right at home for me because I can grab a pair of calipers, take some measurements of the stuff around me, and that improves my modeling ability. So I get to take an idea from a concept to a physical object, and from a physical object to a concept to another physical object, which is really cool for me. But this is the end of the video. I have dragged on quite a bit. This isn't quite as long as the drawing video. Oh my gosh, you guys watched almost an hour, which is insane. But uh, we are coming up on almost the 40 minute mark. So I'm going to bring it to a close here. Let me know what you think down below. Um, again, if you are a professional in the field, please let me know where I can improve. I am always looking to get better. And if you're new to parametric software, what's something that you uh, learned today? Hopefully there was something. And uh, until next time, this is Oddjob Entertainment, signing off.